Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you very much for having me today. Today we're going to be talking about diabetes medications for type 2 diabetes, and the focus is going to be on HIV. However, there isn't a lot of data on diabetes medication in HIV, so what I'm hoping really to share is just clinical pearls about how you utilize all the new and old medications, and hopefully will help you with your best practice for your HIV patients and all patients. So if you've been to the hepatitis C talk, you're going to see a lot of similarities, but what we're trying to really teach is clinical pearls on how to best individualize medications for diabetes management in type 2s with comorbidities. So first, my disclosure. So I've received a consulting fee from Novo Nordis, and I've received investigator-initiated grants from Dexcom, which is a medical device company for continuous glucose monitoring. And then the educational grants for ECHO are from Merck and Novo Nordis as well. Basically, our objectives for today, we're going to try to understand how to safely prescribe and use the older diabetes medications since we have limited time. We're breaking up into two sessions, you know, and really how you want to understand things is you really want to understand the physiology, the mechanism of action, the safety, the tolerability, and how to manage these medications and the side effects so that you can best discuss them with your patients and best optimize them for use. You know, we're going to try to look at them in the context of HIV and then sort of the hot topic or not even new anymore, but what we're really focusing on is how to use these diet medications in the setting of cardiac and renal disease and for the cardiac and renal benefits. So we're going to look first at the older medications, as I said, and then at the newer ones. So... I understand that you guys have received a lot of education on HIV and diabetes, so this is just my summary slide that says, yes, people with HIV are more likely to develop diabetes because of these things. And then what is interesting is it appears that HIV is an independent risk factor when you have diabetes to develop more progressive renal disease. So I think that's important because we all know that in general, about 30% of our patients living with diabetes have some degree of renal insufficiency. So this is my first slide that looks at the algorithm from 2015 from the American Diabetes Association. And I show this because I just remember looking at this many years ago and I was like, aha, metformin, the first choice for diabetes management. And then I was like, oh, there's a lot of classes here that are available. So what do you do? And so, you know, this is really what the heart of the talk is. How do you individualize all the different diabetes medications based on the individual characteristics your patients have so you can best partner with them to empower them with living with diabetes. And so this particular slide has evolved and this is the newest 2021 ADA guidelines. And I'll just tell you again, a very busy slide, if anything, even more busy. But what it highlights again is the large number of classes of medications we now have available, and also some of the individual characteristics that we're going to be looking at for our patients and how to choose the medications. But what we want to highlight even more on this slide is the fact that the newest guidelines say that we should be using these diabetes medications irrespective of the A1C and for glycemic management, but to really think about them for use for cardiac and renal benefit and in those that are at the highest risk for those things. So when we're talking about the medications, we really want you to be thinking about all these things in your head when you're optimizing them for your patients. You know, and honestly, you can answer probably about 70% of these things that you want to look at for the, uh, the medication if you know the mechanism of action. But the other thing you need to know is how good does the medication work, so the efficacy. There are more people that are hospitalized now for hypoglycemia than hyperglycemia, in, especially in our Medicare or older population. And so, you know, what is the risk for hypoglycemia or lack of risk for hypoglycemia or limited risk for hypoglycemia with the medication? Because type 2 diabetes is usually a syndrome of insulin resistance, you know, some degree of beta cell dysfunction over time, but does it help people with weight loss? Is it weight neutral or does it actually cause weight gain? What are the cardiovascular effects? And then how do you use these medications safely in chronic kidney disease? And is there a kidney protective effect to them? How do we best optimize them in our HIV population? And then, you know, we all know that if we don't talk about the side effects and discuss with them the possibilities that the patients are less likely to start the medication because they read something on the insert or they see something on TV. So three months later, they haven't initiated the medication because they have concerns about it. So we really want to be able to best talk to them about the common and serious side effects so they feel comfortable um, and it's not a barrier to them taking the medication. So 
Even though I only have one slide on this, this is usually what I spend 50% of my first visit with a new patient living with diabetes. So small changes in lifestyle. We really have to use our medications as an adjunct for lifestyle. And why is that? Well, what do we know? We know that with as little as 5% lowering of your body weight, you can get beneficial effects for your A1C, your glycemic control, your cholesterol, and your blood pressure. And we know that when we are typically talking with people, we talk about getting at least a 7% or more sustained weight loss. And where does that 7% come from? So probably from the diabetes prevention trial where they aim for greater than 7% or more weight loss. But what do we also know? That our newest studies show that if you have more than 15% weight loss, you're much more likely to be in remission and meaning you don't need any medications for diabetes. However, I don't typically start with telling people they need to lose 15 to 20 percent of their body weight because that can sometimes feel overwhelming. So I do think that what you want to do is set small changes from lifestyle changes and then set small weight loss goals for patients and then once they accomplish them you talk about the benefits of that ongoing weight loss if possible. And then the other thing is, is we could do a whole lecture on insulin as well but what we really need to promote is that do not be afraid to use insulin early, especially in those patients who are glucose toxic. So when the A1C is greater than 10, when they're having symptomatic hyperglycemia, meaning they're thirsty, they're peeing a lot, you know, and they're losing weight, then insulin is the best and probably the only correct option, at least in the short term. And then what you have to remember is, is that once the glucose toxicity resolves, to not keep them on the insulin or at least try to de-escalate the insulin or replace it with some of the other medications we're going to talk about now. So this is just another slide that shows us, yes, we have a lot of classes of medications out there that have a lot of different targets of action. And I'm just also going to use this slide to say that there are two classes of medications just because from a consensus of endocrinologists that we don't really use, so I'm not going to spend time talking about them in the lecture, but just so you know, bromocryptine, which is our dopamine agonist, it's marketed under a medication called Cycloset and is approved for A1C lowering. Um, again, I haven't used it. Occasionally, my pituitary patients are on it, but just so you're aware that bromocryptine does lower the A1C, I think about 0.6% efficacy. Um, the other medication that you know, I think we've tried to use in the past, but are sort of no longer using very commonly as our alpha glucosidase inhibitors. So that's our Icarbos. You think that, it's, that it, in a, it's good because it doesn't have a large risk for low blood sugars and you take it with the meal and it helps the prandial blood glucoses. But, you know, the problem is, is that even though theoretically it should work well, the problem is the side effect profile is very high. And so most people, because of diarrhea and different flatulence issues are un and bloating are unable to tolerate it. I think we still try to use it in our bariatric patients that have reactive hypoglycemia, and it is one of the treatments. So that's the population I've maybe used it in in the last year or two, but I haven't had anyone yet that has tolerated it because of the side effect profile. So just to throw that out there. So now we're gonna actually talk about, like I said, the three older classes of medications. So we're all familiar with biguanines and metformin. And as you saw, you know, metformin still remains the first choice for diabetes management for our medications. And why is that? Well, first the mechanism, how does it work? Well, basically it reduces gluconeogenesis in the liver. So that means, what does that mean? It means, okay, so it doesn't, cause you to produce more insulin, so that's good, right? You have a low likelihood of having low blood sugars, so except for with extreme fasting or intense exercise, you're unlikely to have a low blood sugar with metformin, so that's good. As well, because it doesn't cause the production of insulin, you're less likely to have any weight gain, and most people have some modest weight loss from it, so three to five pounds. So some people don't have any, but the average is probably about three to five pounds with the medication, so that does help people reach their weight loss goal as well. And then um, the efficacy. So the efficacy is good with this medication. It lowers A1C 1% or more. So, you know, because of all these things, that's the reason why it is our first line agent for diabetes management. So what are some of the side effects? So some of the, the most common side effect that you really have to talk to your patient about is the GI or gastrointestinal side effects. So meaning diarrhea, loose stools, and bloating and abdominal pain can come with this medication. But 
what you want to tell this patient is, is that we can start you at a low dose and then we can gradually escalate it over time and you want to give your body at least 10 days to adjust to the medication before we decide it's not the right medication for you. So that's probably my first clinical pearl is, you know, I would say about 50% of patients that come to me that say they are intolerant to metformin really aren't. So as you probably know, there is the extended release and there's the more immediate release metformin. So in people that have had an intolerance to metformin, you really want to assess if they've tried the extended release because the GI side effect profile is much less with metformin extended release. And so in those patients who tell me they have a GI intolerance, I'll start them at 500 extended release daily, and then I'll gradually escalate it every 10 days based on any diarrhea profile. And even if we can just get to 500 twice a day, that's a thousand milligrams daily, and they're going to have some improvement of their diabetes from that medication. And then my next thing about metformin and HIV. So we know it improves insulin sensitivity, but the problem is in people who have uncontrolled HIV or AIDS, obviously you're not going to want to use it in your cachectic patients just because of the GI side effect profile and then its potential to improve diarrhea. And again, I don't think you use like stevatidine very often anymore, but we're going to talk about it in the next slide. This risk for lactic acidosis always has to be in the back of our mind um, when we're talking about the use of metformin. And then as well, some of your other agents are less likely to cause um, lactic acidosis when associated with it. This is what I thought was an interesting study. We always say that metformin is an insulin sensitizer, but what they did is they looked at lipid profile and insulin sensitivity in a group that was on HIV antiretroviral therapy, and they put them on metformin. And unfortunately, they failed to see any metabolic improvements in the, these patients. It was sort of a neutral study. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I actually, you know, this is what I think theoretically we think should happen, but unfortunately, that's not what happened, you know, with the limited evidence we have. So then my next clinical pearl that I wanted to talk about is metformin and use in renal disease because I think this is also something that is misinformation that is often talked to to our patients or I just think what happens is the patients misunderstand, right? So most importantly, what we need to tell our patients is that Metformin does not cause renal disease, right? Their poorly controlled diabetes for multiple years causes renal disease. And we hear a lot from our patients, I'm sure you hear it too, that the metformin caused my renal disease. No, we have to do take the time to explain that the reason that we don't use metformin in progressive renal disease is that there's this rare but serious risk of lactic acidosis. And, you know, the older dogma was that this do not use. So that's what I grew up being trained with an absolute value of greater than 1.5 milligrams per deciliter for creatinine in males and 1.4 milligrams per deciliter in females. And I think that's sort of what we kept in our mind because of this risk for lactic acidosis. But this has actually been updated and the FDA actually updated this in 2016 with new recommendations about metformin. So you know, I often restart people on metformin that were taken off of it because it is such a good medication. You know, so you can continue, you can start metformin as long as the GFR is greater than 45. You don't have to stop the metformin until the GFR is less than 30 because what they found was the absolute risk for lactic acidosis was so low. And so we've already talked about all the benefits of this medication. And so, you know, we do want to be more comfortable continuing it in the appropriate population. And so so in people with renal disease, you know, you don't want to use more than 1,000 milligrams a day, but you're still going to get a good um, medication effect with that dose with a low risk of lactic acidosis. So that's my second clinical pearl with metformin. Continue to use it. Be comfortable using it in people who have stable renal disease and don't stop it if the GFR is greater than 30. So just the other thing about uh, metformin and HIV that came up is that they, some of the antiretroviral medications can increase the metformin levels, so be aware of that. And specifically for the doglaglavir, sorry, I'm not pronouncing your HIV medications very well, you, do wanna not you don't want to take more than a maximum dose of 1,000 milligrams a day. So what about metformin and cardiovascular risk or benefit? So you probably all know UKPDS. That was our largest complication trial for type 2 diabetes, which followed people for years. 
And really impressively, they found that people who were on metformin had a significant benefit from an all-cause mortality and cardiac event thing. And the number needed to treat to avoid one death was only 14, with an absolute risk reduction of 0.7. So amazing information, right? So I took out the slide on the meta-analysis because of time reasons, but the meta-analysis that have come out for all the studies failed to show such a significant benefit. But what you see with the meta-analysis is, is that when metformin is started early, that's when you tend to, tend to see that people trend towards cardiac benefit. And so that's my third clinical pearl about metformin, is that consider using it early in people because of the potential long-term cardiovascular benefit effects. Again, we don't have time to discuss it in this particular lecture, but there are some potential cancer benefits as well. So for those things outside of glycemic control, I do consider using metformin early and even in people who are maybe at their A1C goal. We at least have a discussion about it. And then, you know, with our HIV population, it is important to look at liver disease because we do have a lot of co-infection with hepatitis C. So again, this slide was in my hepatitis C lecture, but it does appear, and I'm just going to say that it does appear that metformin, as long as it's compensated cirrhosis, is beneficial to be used in chronic liver disease. And so my summary of metformin, really do try it again at low dose in those with a history of GI intolerance. Please don't stop the medication if people are stable with stable chronic renal disease. You know, we like it because it's cheap. It has a low risk for hypoglycemia. It causes some slight weight loss. And it may have some cardiovascular benefits. They're all good things. It appears to be beneficial in hep C patients and HIV, at least no harm in the HIV patients. You know, you do want to think about the dose based on what antiretroviral medications you're on and in the setting of renal disease. And then I actually tend to offer patients with prediabetes this medication because of the other benefits. And when you look at the ADA guidelines, they do say to consider it, especially in those that have, a, have had a history and are more likely to develop overt diabetes. So those that have had gestational diabetes are obese with a BMI of 30, and those that are younger and age less than 60. So... Hopefully you learned something from Foreman there, because I know you all use it on a regular basis. So our next class, our sulfonylureas, okay? So what do we need to know about our sulfonylureas? How does the sulfonylureas work? Well, the easy way of thinking about it is they just flog the pancreas to produce more insulin. And so what does that mean? So if you flog the pancreas to produce more insulin, does that mean you're at higher risk for low blood sugars? Yes, correct. Unfortunately, one of the main side effects or risks of, met of the sulfonylureas are hypoglycemia. And then number two, because it causes the production of more insulin, are they weight neutral or do they tend to cause weight gain? They tend to cause a little bit of weight gain, unfortunately. So because of those two things, they become a less desirable medication. However, do they work well? Yes, they do. The efficacy is very good, over 1% for reduction. So they are a good medication for glycemic management, just with those risks and the the lack of benefit for weight loss, okay? So when we're talking within the class of it, this is my first clinical pearl. I think most people are not using gliburide anymore because it tends to be more associated with hypoglycemia, but it is sort of fallen out of favor to use gliburide if you're still using it in your practice. So I would say consider excluding that one from your clinical use. My preference is to use glimipiride, which I think more people use glipizide. I'm not sure how commonly people are using glimipiride, but the reason I preferentially use glimipiride is that what it does is it improves first phase insulin secretion, which means then it acts in a dependent manner, so with the higher sugars after the meals. So then hopefully it helps reducing the postprandial hyperglycemia. And when they did studies, unfortunately, glipizide did not show that same first phase insulin secretion effect. So that's why I tend to preferentiate it. This is my second clinical pearl, and not everyone does this, but when you start basal insulin, a lot of people stop sulfonylureas. So because of that first phase effect, I may use a reduced dose of glimipiride, but I'll still continue somewhere between two and four milligrams daily of the glimipiride because it does help with the postprandial hyperglycemia and our basal insulin, you know, is just a set amount and doesn't surge for a meal. Again, some physicians and endocrinologists do stop sulfonylureas. I just make sure the patient isn't on too much basal insulin 
and we recommend not more than 0.5 units per kilogram, and many people are on much more than that. So if you're going to use a sulfonylurea, make sure you don't over-basal insulin people, and then I do continue it in those that are on basal insulin. So now let's talk about side effect profile. The nice thing about uh, sulfonylureas is that you don't have a large side effect profile except for that risk for hypoglycemia and for, you know, allergic reaction. And there's a cross-reactivity with sulfa drugs by about 20% if you're allergic to sulfa drugs. So that's the benefit of this medication, that it's effective, it's cheap. And for those people that tend to have a lot of stomach upset and side, GI side effect profile, it still potentially remains, you know, a good medication choice. What about its use in chronic kidney disease? So... What I will tell you is, is that you can use it in chronic kidney disease. With the glimipiride, which is my preference, you would just start at a reduced dose at one to two milligrams a day daily. You typically don't want to use it in stage four or higher because it's a 24-hour medication. So in stage four, so a GFR less than 30, then you probably want to use the short-acting glipizide at a dose of 2.5 milligram daily because it's going to last in the body. And we all see that people can still get hypoglycemia after they stop this medication. So there's a very long half-life. So definitely, you know, we've seen people hospitalized for hypoglycemia, you know, 72 hours after they stop the medication and it still can be an effect of like the longer acting glimipiride. So we do have to be very careful about use in our renal patients. What about it's, um, this idea of cardiovascular benefit or risk? So I think the older teaching or the older thought and this was because of the older generations of sulfonylureas, which we don't use anymore, was there was this concern for ischemic preconditioning, meaning that the older generation sulfonylureas actually increased the cardiovascular event rate. But this was a recent meta-analysis that was done on the newer generations of sulfonylureas and the ones that we currently use, and what they found was that there was no increased risk for all-cause mortality, or cardiovascular mor mortality. And actually, when you look at the non-fatal ma macrovascular outcomes, actually it favored sulfonylurea a little bit. And it probably is because the efficacy is very good, right? So people were getting better glycemic control. But I think, you know, what we now know is that there isn't an increased risk with sulfonylureas for cardiovascular, and they tend to be at best cardiovascular neutral. So that's a good thing. So what about sulfonylureas and liver disease? I think the main thing is just you know, in cirrhosis, obviously there's many things that increase your risk for hypoglycemia, but cirrhosis is one of them. And so, you know, you want to, this is not the medication of choice in people who have liver disease. So again, it has some good things, but use in liver disease is probably, if possible, avoiding. And then what about sulfonylureas and HIV? There is some thought that to use the glimipiride, as I said, because some of the protease inhibitors, I guess, can cause a defect in the first phase insulin secretion. So, you know, it might help as an adjunct to that. The other thing I wanted to bring up is that, you know, two of the most commonly used medications are metformin and sulfonylurea. So this third bullet point was a study where they looked at metformin versus sulfonylurea, and they found the glycemic overall control was about the same. But I did want this to point out that in general, our black and Hispanic patients did worse with the initial glycemic management. And, you know, we had that recent study that came out that just showed that in our minority populations, we're not escalating medications. So I do want us to think about it in all our populations and for equity, especially when we start talking about the newest classes of medications, to try to advocate for access for all and to for glycemic management and control for all patients. So my summary on sulfonylurea. So I, again, I use glimipiride with basal insulin, and so you consider that use in your practice if you feel like it's appropriate. I use glimipiride preferentially because of the post-meal benefit. When you have a lower GFR, just start at a lower dose, one milligram of glimipiride, and then only use the short-acting glipizide um, when the GFR is less than 30. There is some weight gain. There's no cardiac benefit, but there's also no harm. It is cost effective, but we increase the risk for hypoglycemia not recommended in those with liver disease. So our last um, class we're going to talk about today is our DTP4 inhibitors. And again, I think people are fairly comfortable with the use of DTP4 inhibitors, but let's talk a little bit about them because I actually think this is the medication that I would recommend to use the least and in a select population just because of the expense of it. Because this is one of our first more expensive medications we're going to talk about. So how do the DTP4 inhibitors work? So, well, we're going to talk about GLP-1 
next week a little bit more, but there's this gut hormone, um, GLP, and what it does is DTP4 inhibitors inhibits the breakdown of GLP-1. And what GLP-1 does is it causes us to slow peristalsis, so we tend to feel full sooner. Um, it acts centrally in ways we don't quite understand to suppress the appetite. And then finally, it causes the production of insulin, but in a dependent to the elevated glucose levels after a meal. So because of its mechanism of action, you can then answer, do you have a, a high risk for hypoglycemia with this? No, there's very little risk for hypoglycemia with this medication, which is one of the benefits of it. Does it cause any weight loss? The answer, unfortunately, you'd think because of its mechanism of action is no, but you think maybe, but because um, I think because in general what they found is that sometimes we GLP-1 is sort of lacking in our diabetes and obese patients that we maybe don't get the same effect when we just inhibit the breakdown of it. So it's weight neutral rather than causing any weight loss. And then what about the efficacy? And this is what I really want to highlight. The efficacy is less than 1%, so typically 0.6% is the best that I see with the DTP4 inhibitor. So it's a fairly weak agent, and so we really do want to think about using it in a select population. So what are other reasons why we like it? Well, you know, this is the medication I might choose because of its low side effect profile. It really doesn't have a lot of side effects. Things that you have to counsel people about is that Rarely you can get a headache and flu-like symptoms from it. Um, I've maybe seen one or two cases, you know, in the 13 years I've been prescribing the medication. And then there was a newer FDA um, warning put out that it can cause severe joint pains. I think I had one person that may have had that. So just to be aware of telling people that they're really uncommon, but this is a potential of the side effect. And then you do have to counsel them that there is a potential small increased risk for pancreatitis. Although when you look at the meta-analysis, is there plus minus? And as we know, there's many reasons for pancreatitis. So now about... Now, what about in chronic kidney disease? So the other nice thing about um, DTP4 inhibitors is you can use it in chronic kidney disease. So I think... I'm just going to highlight uh, stitagliptin because I think that's one of our more commonly available ones on the formulary, which is also called Genuvia. So you would just reduce it to 50 milligrams if the GFR was less than 45 and to 25 when the uh, GFR is less than 30. Linagliptin or Trigenta, I think, is our other most commonly used um, DTB4 inhibitor. And the nice thing about this medication is it's not renally cleared. And so um, this is one that we can use in chronic kidney disease without dose adjustment. So we do have safety data on it from stage one to stage four. But we don't really have data on it or very limited data in end-stage renal disease. Have I kept people on linagliptin in end-stage renal disease if they just need a whiff of, whiff of medication? Yes, I just want to point out that there's limited data on use in end-stage renal disease. But because of its low risk for hypoglycemia, it is you know, nice if you can continue to use it in those with chronic kidney disease and closer to end-stage uh, kidney disease. Now, what about the cardiovascular outcome studies for DTB4 inhibitors? And, you know, they've honestly been very disappointing. And this is another reason why, you know, I think we want to only utilize the DTB4 inhibitors in a select population is that, you know, the three largest studies that came out, and actually the Carolina study just came out as well, which is the first cardiovascular, fourth cardiova the large cardiovascular study on DTB4 inhibitors, and basically the cardiovascular status of these patients where they were already at uh, already had known disease or were at high risk but they unfortunately failed to show any benefit okay and then saxagliptin and allagliptin and that's probably why we don't see them used as much um, or used very much is that they had this trend towards worsening congestive heart failure so Again, we didn't see that with citagliptin or linagliptin, but um, the risk, increased risk for heart failure. But in general, these studies, the, they're considered cardiovascular neutral. And that's sort of why I think they started to follow a favor for use that in the fact that the efficacy isn't, you know, for A1C lowering isn't great. So what about DTB4 inhibitors and HIV? So the one, one thing we do like about the DTB4 inhibitors is that there is this thought process that they do reduce inflammation and chronic immune cell activation. And so, you know, theoretically, there could be some benefit in the HIV population. 
there was also a question, could it actually affect viral load? And so the answer is no, that it's safe to use in those patients with HIV. At least a small pilot study showed that. And then we all know that our HIV patients tend to be a little bit more risk for cardiovascular disease. So they're really hoping that they would find indicators of depression, inflammation when they use the citagliptin. But they, um, the one primary marker, they did not find any significant change from it. But they did find that there was another marker that was consistent with arthrogenesis that did slightly decline. Again, these are just small pilot studies. So we don't really have any data on if uh, uh, the DTP4 inhibitors help uh, with cardiovascular events in HIV-specific population, but theoretically, they, there may be a little bit more benefit than in the general population. So, and the final thing is, is that we really haven't seen DTP4 inhibitors show any improvement in progression to end-stage renal disease or worsening renal disease, but it does have some data that it does improve microalbuminuria and progression of the uh, microalbumin. So there may be some mild renal beneficial effect uh, for the DTP4 inhibitors. So, and then finally, DTP4 inhibitors in liver disease. Again, there's just limited data. Again, there's this idea that maybe there's some inflammation protective effect, but we really don't have a lot of information on it. And the NASH data we have is that it doesn't really cause a significant benefit for those patients. So, so my summary of the DTP4 inhibitor. So, you know, I just want to highlight again, very mild glycemic benefit. You can use it in renal disease and it may have some potential renal benefit in those with microalbinuria. There is a significant cost. It's $200 to $400 a month. And so, I do, you know, I do think we have to really think about that in the setting of no cardiovascular benefit and then the heart failure stuff, you know, in those other uh, medications within the class that we are not typically using, I don't think. But it doesn't cause any weight loss. But the flip side of it is, is well tolerated. And so definitely, you know, my 70-year-old woman who is frail, who has an A1C of eight, where I really just want an A1C of seven and a half, this is the medication I would choose. Would I choose it in a 40-year-old man whose A1C was 10 and whose BMI was 30? No. So, uh, and that's more of our population, I think, unfortunately, or our 50, let's say 55-year-old person. So I do think, you know, it is an easy medication to prescribe, but we really need to think about when we utilize it. And it's a good medication in certain populations and select populations. So I will end there for the day to answer any questions. And I'm a talker, so of course I probably went over. Sorry. <laughs>